Today, we are talking about the U.S. Census and some tips that you may not be aware of. So we're going to start with some basics and kind of build up to these tips real quick. The U.S. Census began in 1790 and was produced every decade since then and is still available today through 1940. It was created to count the persons in each area of the United States so that the government could know how many representatives they needed in each district. Because of the 72-year Privacy Act, the U.S. Census schedules are not available to the general public after 1940. We'll talk about that more in just a few moments, but first let me introduce myself. My name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further faster and factually with your family research. Now if this is your first time here, you should know that there is a Facebook page, a newsletter, and a website at genealogytv.org. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time I upload a video. Now, the top 10 things you should know about the U.S. Census when we come back. All right, here we go. We're going to talk about the 10 tips that I have for you on U.S. Census records. These are th some of these you may be aware of and others you may not be. So hopefully you'll hang in there uh, and and watch the whole video because I'm sure that there may be something that you aren't aware of. So here we go. Uh also, before we totally get into the tips, I want to remind you that I have more videos about census records. Uh, there's an entire playlist devoted to that on uh, genealogytv.org. As a matter of fact, let me pull this up for you so that you are aware that uh, at the top of the screen here, make sure that you click on playlists and make sure that you hit created playlists and hit search because... That'll give you all the playlists. Basically, it's all the videos grouped into various subjects. And down here at the bottom, there is uh, U.S. Census records uh, because that was one of the first ones I did. So it's kind of at the bottom of the list. But um, that's uh, a quick and dirty way that you can uh, get to all the census uh, videos. You could also just do a search on the videos for uh, the word census and it'll pull up most of them. Um, okay, so now let me get to my slideshow here. So tip number one is that not all census is created equal. Okay, so prior to 1850, only the head of household was named. Now, a lot of you may already realize that, um, but uh, some of you, this may be new information. So 1850 and uh, coming closer to present time, uh, everyone in the household is named, but remember we're working backwards. So if you're starting in 1900 and working back to 1880, 1870, 1860, 1850, you got all your families named in those census records. Now you're going back to 1840, but only the head of household is named. How do you tie that stuff together? So I have a couple tips for you. Let me give you a quick demonstration. So I'm going to use my great grandmother, Rebecca, as an example and, you know, we find her in, in the uh, 1910 census. Um, she's 80 years old here, 1900. She's listed at 70 years old and so on. So we go back. And one of the things that I like to do as we're tying it back and we're starting to try and get track way back. Now, keep in mind, she was supposedly born in 1829, I believe it was. I do what I call census tracking. And to do census tracking, what I do is I create a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet and across the top, um, I put 18, uh, 30, you know, whatever the age, the range of years that you want to do for a certain family. Now here's my, uh, great grandmother down here and her family, her father and her mother. Okay. And their information. So. As you can see, when we're tracking backwards, here she was in that 18, uh, you know, 80 years old uh, in 1910, 1900. She's 70 years old. They kind of go uh, dark for a couple decades because they're in transit and moving. And I do have some more of that information. I just haven't plugged it all in. She shows up in 1860 as a 30-year-old. Here she's actually 20 years old. Um, and why she's listed as a 16-year-old, I don't know. It could have been the informant was not giving good information. 
I, I don't know. And she's 11 in 1840. Now this here, this section here, I am estimating the ages, okay? And I estimated it for everybody in the family. Now these birth years were given to me um, by one of the later census information, a collection of them over the time, and I've pulled that together in my little Excel spreadsheet. So all of these uh, ages are based on a, a formula that I created from their birth year counting backwards so that I can get an idea so that I can see if things line up properly. Now, just let's pause on that for a moment and jump back over to uh, the census records. When you start getting back to, uh, say, 1840, that same John Henley appears here, and I'll let me pop that back up just so I can tell you what I'm doing. Here's John Henley. He's the head of household, born in 1793, died in, in 1854, so he doesn't make it into anything later than the 1850 census, and I don't even have him listed here at the, at the moment. Um, but what you can do is you can start lining up these people. So here, for example, John Henley has uh, in the household two males ages 5 to under 10. So if you have your Excel spreadsheet going, these are those two males right here. And so what I did was I started color coding everything that matched in that 1840 census to make sure that I had the right people. And so, um, again, you keep going on down the list. John Henley has uh, one male uh, 10 to 15, one male 15 to 20, and so on. And what you can do is never going to line up perfectly. Don't expect it to. And the reason why is, look at here. Here we have a son who's not showing up in, uh, in that census. Here's another male who's not showing up in the census. Why? Because they're probably farmhands on somebody else's farm. And that wherever they're sleeping is where they were uh, recorded in the census. So it's very likely that these two boys were uh, farmed out, if you will. These two um, children, Alexander and Margaret, are old enough to have been married off by then. So it's very possible that... Um, they would not have shown up in those little tick marks anyway. Um, but that's a quick and dirty explanation of how you can kind of outline your family to kind of trace them from decade to decade so that you can make sure that you have the right family. Um, again, you know, they're not always going to line up perfectly, but as you can see here, you know, she's listed as 16 years old in, in the 1850 census and... According to everything else I have, she should have been more like 20 or 21 years old. So it'll never be perfect, but, you know, so be it. That's where you start thinking about uh, think, uh, language probability. So if it doesn't line up perfectly, do you say that's absolute proof? You know, that's up for interpretation. You can also take the neighbors. This is a great tip. So you take the neighbors that are around the people that are living in that each census and then go to the next census and see if those same neighbors are in and around uh, your ancestors. And if they are, then you know you have the right family. Okay. So now moving on to tip number two. And tip number two is really using the spreadsheets that I was talking about. I also have another video um, called the number one way to break down your brick walls, a trick to making cluster research faster and really a popular video. Um, it's a technique that I just kind of developed on the fly one weekend where you can extract the data off of, um, ancestry or may, you might be able to do it on others, but basically, uh, you extract the data out, you put it in an Excel spreadsheet and then you can filter it. And by filtering it in Excel spreadsheets, you can filter it by everybody with the same last name, or you can filter it by all males if you're looking for a, a male, or you can, you know, filter it by certain uh, ages, or you can do a combination of a lot of things. And so that video, I talk about how I narrowed it, uh, a mystery down to about four guys. Um, and so it kind of ties in with what I'm talking about here. So 
that was that was a cool video. Links for that will be in uh, the newsletter and at genealogytv.org. Okay, citizenship questions. So um, what I would like to do for this is to bring this up full because it's really kind of hard to see. And uh, for myself as well, I'm going to pull it up full so I can see it <laughs> a little bit easier. But this this chart I created so that I could kind of at a glance see, first of all, who was named uh, in what years and who was just the head of household. So basically this shows you from 1840 on backwards, it was just the head of household. But really this has to do with citizenship questions, this chart here. So as you can see by the little check marks is where or what type of citizenship questions were being asked. So in some cases, um, it, it's asking, for example, in 1870, it's not only asking where the place of birth of the person on, on that line, but also was the father of foreign born, but it doesn't necessarily say where, okay? But by 19, uh, excuse me, 1880, it starts asking the father's birthplace and the mother's birthplace. When we get all the way down to 1920, it starts asking about the father's birthplace, but also the native tongue of the father and the mother's birthplace and the native tongue of the mother. And can they speak English? There's actually quite a bit of information there in the 1920 census. So it's kind of interesting. They also ask for the year of immigration. Um, were they naturalized in the year of naturalization? So there's quite a bit of information. When we get down to 1940, however, you can see that um, those questions are only in the supplemental questions only, which were uh, in 1940 were only two lines per page. And in 1950, which is not out yet, um, it is on um, several more lines on the page, but uh, it's my understanding the 1950 uh, census will be the last time they ask about citizenship questions. And so um, I will make this chart available as well uh, through a link uh, in the newsletter and at genealogytv.org. And tip number four is beyond the population schedule. So I'm suggesting that you, if you, if it fits for your ancestor to look at other schedules. There are mortality schedules, veteran schedules, slave schedules, um, Indian and Native American census rolls. There's quite a bit of other information that is available out there. So um, make sure you're mindful of that when you are doing your research. Don't stop at just the population schedule. If it fits, uh, do a little bit digger, deeper digging. Um, tip number five is about those supplemental questions. And the supplemental questions um, on the, this is a, an example of the 1940 census. Let me pull that up a little bit bigger so you can see it. Um, there were two lines, line 14 and line 29. If you happen to have an ancestor who fell on one of those lines, then there was more information at the bottom of the page, which um, for myself has been wildly helpful um, giving additional information. And in this case, in the 1940 census, they also ask just on those two lines where the father and mother were born. And so um, that can be that can be very helpful. Uh, moving on to tip number six is look for the enumeration maps. So, you know, at the top of the census page, it says the enumeration district, which you should be putting in all of your source citations anyway. But uh, there is also uh, maps for the 1940 census. Now, I've not had a tremendous amount of luck with those maps, um, but they are out there. They're a little challenging to um, search. I have uh, played with the um, search engine on Ancestry.com, on stevemorse.org, and at archives.gov. I found Ancestry to be the easiest. Um, in fact, I used keywords in Ancestry to find specifically, I got it down to the page in, that you're seeing here on the screen, and it gave me a specific map. However, when I, this was Los Angeles County, and when I was digging into it, it was very challenging to see 
um, the little uh, references for the the little tiny districts where the census guy was walking. So um, it's a bit challenging. Keep in mind in the 1940 census too that they gave a lot of street information. So um, not always, but I believe in the experience of my ancestors, I have been able to find street names and stuff and been able to just Google it and found them that way. Uh, the street location at least. So um, hopefully that was helpful. Tip number seven, residents in 1935 in the 1940 census. Again, the 1940 census had a lot of great information. And one of the questions they asked was, where were you in 1935? Well, that helps fill in the gap between, you know, 1930 and 1940. When they're asking, where were you in 1935? It helps uh, pinpoint uh, a location in your timeline for your ancestors. Tip number eight, free census forms. So you can get these free census forms um, and they're basically blank boilerplate if you want to actually uh, extract information onto a form. I don't do that so much anymore as I do use them for reference material when I want to see the headers. You know, I just sometimes a, a, a printed form is easier to see. You can get those at Ancestry, Family Search, Census.gov. Uh, I found some at Midwest Genealogy Center and Cindy's List, uh, just to name a few. Uh, they're, they're out there in a variety of areas. You can get one for every uh, decade, and um, that may be helpful. Uh, you can also get these header forms that just show you the headers of each of the census on two pages. Um, uh, I found these at Family Search. They only go up to 1930. They do not include 1940, but um, that can be helpful too, just as a as a reference point. Um, number nine is enumeration instructions. Now I've found these enumerator instructions to be quite helpful, especially when you're researching different decades and you're going, I don't understand what this means, um, or what this little symbol means. And so if you go and seek out the census instructions for enumerators, I'll leave a link for that as well. Um, it can be very helpful to answer some of those questions as to what the understanding is about different little nuances within what the census, census taker was writing because they had very specific instructions about what to do in certain situations. And so it can give you some insight as to what was going on with your ancestor. That might be a tip that you could use. Uh, number 10 was who's the informant. And I found this to be uh, probably one of the most enlightening things that a lot of people don't realize. But when the census taker was walking around and he's writing things down, you've got to be thinking about who was the informant. And this goes for any record. This goes for a death certificate, birth certificate, marriage certificate, so on. Um, any kind of record. Who is the informant? you got to be thinking about that because it uh, speaks to the reliability of the record itself. So if the census taker is walking around, he's been to that same house three times and there's nobody home. I don't know, maybe they're on vacation or something. Um, a, they probably went to the neighbor. And the neighbor sat and said, well, you know, I think that little girl, I think she's six years old. And I think the older boy is maybe nine years old. And, you know, so he's writing down what the neighbor's saying. And the neighbor may be wrong. Or grandma's in the house and she's a little senile. And she's the one giving the information because the parents are off at work. You know, they're out in the farm field or wherever. And uh, so the elder is giving information and she might not have it uh, down herself as to when those children were born or the full name of of the spouse in the household or where the spouse's parents were born, all of that information, she may not have a full understanding uh, of who it was that she was giving information about. So um, also know that they may not speak English well. Um, so it, spelling of names or information may have been interpreted incorrectly. Sometimes people deliberately gave false information for whatever reason. Um, you know, typical data errors, spelling errors, that kind of stuff. Um, and keep in mind that large populations could not read and write. Um, so it could be that they were giving the spelling of the name to the best of their ability. Um, 
And keep in mind that there was uh, a lack of, of documentation about births. So especially in a household um, that could not read and write, they may not have written information about who was born when. So uh, all of that keep in mind. So a couple uh, other little tips here. On the 1940 census, it does uh, state who the informant was. In this case, here's a couple lines out of the 1940 census, where Francis Madsen here is has that circle with an X in it um, that is denoting that she is the informant on that, uh, on that date and place in time. That is the only one that actually names the informant. All right, some bonus tips for you. Make sure you're looking at state censuses. Every state had different censuses and some of them didn't have them at all, but a lot of times they would be in between the decades of the federal census. So if they exist, um, then that could be uh, helpful too. You might look at your state archives to begin that search. Um, Look for uh, census substitutes. Uh, as you probably know, we lost nearly all of the 1890 census uh, due to a fire. It was actually water damage due to a fire. Um, and so many of the um, organizations have created indexes to help replace that 1890 data. So some of that data might be coming from uh, things like census, I mean, city directories, state censuses, whatever other records are out there, um, sometimes there are um, indexes that try, are trying to help fill in that gap uh, around the 1890 schedules. Keep in mind there are other uh, censuses beyond just the population schedule. Most of what we've been talking about here are the population schedules, but there are also mortality schedules, Indian census rolls, slave schedules, agricultural uh, manufacturing schedules, social uh, statistics schedules, and business schedules. So um, be thinking of that. If it fits your ancestor, then that might be something that you want to seek out as well. For more information about any of this, all the links and things that we've been talking about, I will make available at genealogytv.org as well as uh, at the newsletter. So make sure you're signed up with that. And that is my 10 plus a couple more <laughs> tips for today. Well, I hope that was helpful. If so, give me a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you would like to become a patron of Genealogy TV, you can do so at uh, patreon.com forward slash genealogy TV. There should be some more videos on the screen for you now related to the census as well as probably the latest video that I have uploaded. Okay, well it is time for you to go find your ancestors and maybe in census records. So until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.